Welcome to Gospel Parenting's third seminar in the Building Kingdom Family series entitled Building Purity, Teaching Your Teen the Purpose and Power of Sex. Now this seminar is designed for parents, but you can tell by the title, uh, Teaching Your Teen, that's for parents. But it's also uh, perfectly acceptable for teenagers to watch as well because there's going to be a lot of good stuff for you and you need to learn this stuff as a teen. So you're, you're, uh, you'll find it very profitable as well. Now some people feel that discussing the whole concept of purity in today's culture is really ridiculous. Uh, and living a, a pure life sexually in today's culture for, for a, a Christian teenager is certainly not uh, an easy task because sex is everywhere. The prevailing wisdom in the culture is that sex sells. Practically every magazine, every billboard, every TV commercial pictures scantily clad young women selling everything from automobiles to cough syrup. <laughs> and television and moving pictures uh, show pre and extramarital sex as exciting and normal and try to convince you that everyone who is not completely repressed or personally repulsive is engaged in it. Each fall, the new TV shows push the envelope, quote, push the envelope of on-screen sexual acceptability. To use that phrase, first I think used by a man named Stephen Bochco, the producer of NYPD Blue in 1995. And at, at that particular point, that's what he did. He pushed the envelope. And, but frankly, what he did then is mild compared to what's shown on TV today. Now, what's happened to the Christian moral fiber of our country? It seems we've lost our moral bearings completely. I can remember in 1993, Jocelyn Elders, who was the, um, the Surgeon General in the Clinton administration, actively promoting condom distribution in high schools. Now this is a direct quote from the New York Times. We've taught our children what to do in the front seat of automobiles. It's time that we taught them what to do in the back seat. And she uh, said in the same article, I tell every girl when she goes out on a date to put a condom in her purse. Now public attitudes are no different today if not even more permissive. Now, if our nation's leadership is actually promoting immorality in our public institutions, what chance do our children have to remain sexually pure physically in what has become a wicked and perverse generation? Well, I believe that we have a really good chance if we keep several things in mind. Number one, we need to know that we are in a culture war. We're in a battle for our culture. These things that are happening out there are not happening by chance. The change in our, in our uh, uh, moral view in our country uh, over the last several decades is not an accident. So number one, we've got to be aware that there's a culture war that's raging. Number two, we must have a basic understanding of the nature of that war. Paul says we are not ignorant of his devices, of Satan's devices. In other words, Paul says we know what he's doing. And we got to know how to fight that battle. We recognize what Satan's about. And number two, we've got to know how to fight him. And then number three, if we understand, and this is primarily what we're going to talk about today, if we understand God's beautiful, fulfilling plan for sex as revealed in the Bible, we must not simply tell our kids, don't. The Bible says don't, so don't. Don't get involved in sex. But we also must tell them, why don't? There are reasons beyond it's because the Bible says don't. There are reasons past that, and we must find out what they are and communicate those to our kids. In the six sessions in this seminar, I want to attempt to equip you with the necessary information to be armed and ready. First, to be successful in your own family, to stand against Satan's sex disinformation campaign, and then to arm you and your children to help in the battle 
to cap recapture our culture from one who is, to most Christians, a shadowy, indefinable enemy. They're not sure what he's like. They're not real sure what he's doing. There are feelings inside, but, but I don't really know. We want to be able to say with Paul, we are not ignorant of his devices. Okay, now, with that introduction, we're ready for our first session, and it's, uh, you'll see this in your outline number one. Session one, why fence me in? Now, sex, you need to know, you need to understand at the outset here, sex was God's idea. He's the one that thought it up. Now, he invented it for several reasons that we're going to cover in great detail in this seminar. I want you to know that sex is a powerful engine in your body, a powerful motor that God has placed in each one of us that he uses to and this may shock you, to run his family business. You know that? Sex runs God's family business. And that business is this, to extend his kingdom under the rule of his son, Jesus Christ, over the whole earth. As with any motor, with any engine, the operator must know how to use it before turning it on. Now, God has left us an owner's manual the last thing you want to pick up when you start a new engine, when you pick up a new tool. Who checks out the owner's manual? Nobody does. But he's left us the Bible, and we need to understand and follow its instructions carefully in order to achieve effective and maximum results from this powerful engine that we find within our bodies. Now, the last thing as I mentioned, most of us want to do when we get a new engine, a new toy to play with, is to read the owner's manual before we get the engine started. Now, we are so eager to begin the task at hand that we think we'll learn as we go. There's no reason to read the instruction manual. We're going to learn as we go. But in the case of sex, if we don't follow the manual, Serious injury. You, you see the little signs on the, be sure and read the instruction manual before starting the engine. Serious, or a serious injury could result. Uh, but with, with this particular motor, injury is sure to occur. The instructions in the manual include the where for sex. This is what the manual is going to show you as, as you look in the Bible at the appropriate sections of Scripture. The where for sex, and that's the topic of our, our first session. Number two, the why for sex, that's session number two. The how and the when to turn on the engine, that's also very, very critical. Because once it's running, this particular engine is almost impossible to turn off. Now we're going to cover all those topics in later sessions in the seminar. Okay, Roman 2 on your outline. We're looking at the marriage covenant. Now, when a, when a man and woman are married, they enter into a covenant with each other and with God. They promise to do certain things before all the witnesses who are in attendance uh, on their wedding day. Now, now, today, marriage vows are almost a formality. Nobody really pays that much attention to them. You don't listen that much, and, and you don't even pay much attention to what you say. But I always make it clear in my marriage ceremonies uh, that entering into covenant with God and with each other is very, very serious. For God hears your vows and holds you accountable to keep them. A covenant always has sanctions or results now, there are positive results that invariably accrue to covenant keepers and negative results that accrue to covenant breakers. So when God is invited to participate in a marriage ceremony, it's a very, very serious matter because it's a covenant with him. Now, this understanding of marriage is the context of a sexual relationship that can be all that God intended. Marriage and sex 
are inseparably linked together in Hebrews 13, chapter 13, verse 4. And this is what God says there. Now listen to this. Marriage is honorable among all, and the marriage bed is undefiled. But fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. Now in, the, in this verse, sex in marriage is given blessing. But sex outside of marriage, God condemns. Now 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10 says basically the, the same idea. It says, Paul says in, in these verses, those who practice fornication, adultery, and homosexuality, among other sins, will not, quote, inherit the kingdom of God. Now from these two portions of Scripture, we can see that God looks with favor on sex, but only within the bonds of marriage. Now that's not because he's an old meanie who hates us and doesn't want us to have any fun but because he loves us and knows that there are long-term negative consequences when his parameters are ignored. Now, there are a number of scriptures. I only picked a couple out here, but there are a number of scriptures in both the Old and New Testaments that say basically the same thing. God is adamant about the fact that sex is to be exclusively within the context of marriage. Now, why is that true? There is a why. That's, that's not news to you. You knew that. But there's a why. Why is sex outside of marriage such a bad thing? Sexual purity, meaning sex only within marriage, is very important for a good reason. One overwhelming reason. In other words, there is a why for God's law concerning sex that is not clearly understood, I believe, in the Christian community. Okay, Roman numeral three. In Genesis 1, 26, God lays out the ultimate purpose for man when he says, let us make man in our image and let them have dominion over the earth. This verse tells us that man was created to rule over God's creation. Then the next chapter, Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, in speaking of marriage, he says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Now I want to put those two verses together. In Genesis chapter 1, the verse on rule. Our purpose is to rule for God over his creation. And then in Genesis chapter 2, leaving father and mother and becoming one flesh with your wife or with your husband. Now, this is what this means. Putting these two verses together mean this. God gave man a helper in his ruling task to become, as the Bible says, one flesh with him, to be his completer, to help him as he enters the family business of extending God's kingdom. Now we'll look at what one flesh means in great detail in the next session. But Paul gives us some insight in 1 Corinthians 6 as to how one flesh happens. He quotes Genesis 2.24 and then applies it to sex with a prostitute. And here's what he says. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Now remember, the Corinthians came out of a pagan background. Sex was a part of their worship. Uh, uh, prostitutes, a part of their worship, their pagan worship. Sex was like taking a drink of water for them. And now they've met the Lord, and their lives are not immediately changed. They continue to live in the way they've always lived. It's just, it's just how they do it. So here's what Paul says. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ. Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one flesh with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. He quotes that Genesis chapter 2 verse. 
Now, sex with a prostitute has nothing to do with becoming one by having the same life goals, the same interests, the same compatibility, or all the other ways one might become one or one flesh with a woman or with your wife. If you become one flesh with a prostitute, as Paul argues here, that must occur purely through the physical act of sex because that's all that happens with a prostitute. You don't even know her name. There's no oneness there except physical. But Paul says that's how the one flesh relationship occurs. Now this verse shows that sex is much more far-reaching than simply a physical experience. That's why sex is so important. Sex actually forms the one flesh relationship between husband and wife and then becomes the basis for oneness in all the other areas of a marriage that are so crucial. Sex is not simply physical like any other bodily function, but it's designed by God to be a total person act where two people are tied together by an invisible cord a soul tie, that's the phrase I like to use, a soul tie that hooks two people to one another. Paul says that even happens when a man has sex with a prostitute. Now this is what evolutionary humanists cannot accept about sex. If man is purely an animal, the product of evolution, without a soul, then sex is just a pleasurable physical act with no consequences. Why not have sex whenever you feel like it with whoever is physically attractive to you? Now that's what the, the, the humanists advocate. And that humanistic reasoning is why the Christian must not unconsciously buy into their lifestyle, which is what we're doing. The church is being conformed to the humanist mold without even knowing it, particularly in the area of sex, because sex is so prevalent around us. It screams at us from every corner. Why not? Why not buy in? Because man is much more than an animal. He is a creature made in God's very image who was designed by God as a sexual being to become a two-person, male-female, one-flesh fighting unit in God's army to extend his kingdom over the earth through sex. That one-flesh unit is the primary way God deploys his troops. Now, let me, let me emphasize this. There, there are single people. Some people, are, Paul says, are called to be single, and they have special tasks to do. But the primary way God deploys his troops is through one flesh, two person fighting units. And that unit is put together by sex. To tamper with the way God designed the units and put them together is to seriously hinder the family business. Now can you see that sex is intended by God to be the foundation of marital oneness? Without sex, two people may live together be great friends, agree on any number of issues, walk in harmony together, but they're not one flesh. You're one flesh through sex. Roman 4, the first purpose of the marriage covenant. Okay, we've got the one flesh unit. We see it's designed to be expressed in marriage. Now then, what about that marriage covenant? The first purpose is protection of that one fleshness, protection of that one flesh relationship. Now today, many people don't get married. They say marriage is unnecessary today. We'll just live together. It's an outdated relic of the past. It's puritanical. Why is it necessary to publicly make covenant with each other 
and with God. Well, marriage is like an oyster. The marriage covenant entered into in a public ceremony before the whole world and all outdoors is the shell that protects the oyster. The real animal in that marriage relationship, the real animal is the unseen, one flesh, sexual relationship that is safely protected inside the shell. Another illustration pictures the marriage covenant as a moral protective fence around the one flesh relationship. Society has historically recognized the importance of protecting that relationship and has enacted civil laws that do so. Now, until my generation, divorces were really hard to obtain, as there had to be, quote, grounds. And those grounds were usually some reason for the divorce that had a biblical basis, like adultery, desertion, and so on. No-fault divorce has changed all of that. And getting in and out of marriage is now really, really easy. It's as though marriage is little more than a legal living agreement, arrangement. The marital union is receiving less and less of a unique economic protection. Our tax laws are less and less structured to, to uniquely favor the biblical family above other living arrangements. And medical benefits that used to be only for biblical families are now often available to, quote, domestic partners. And read their live-in lovers either homosexual or heterosexual. See, these changes are subtly occurring as humanism becomes our national religion and gains more and more of a foothold in America. So, the first purpose of marriage is to provide protection for the one flesh sexual relationship. It keeps all intruders out. The rings on the fingers of both man and woman signify they are both taken. They're already one flesh with another. And they are off limits to outside advances. But the marriage fence does something else. It also keeps each partner in. <laughs> Not only intruders out, but partners in. The vows they took were very serious. And whether understood or not, they were heard by God, and if broken, will call down sanctions on the head of the one who broke them. A proper understanding of those vows goes a long way to keeping a Christian faithful in times of temptation. Okay, second pur purpose of marriage. First is protection. Second purpose of the fence why fence me in is the title of this session. The second purpose of the fence. The second thing the marriage covenant does is provide a secure, permanent atmosphere that allows the development of true intimacy. The fence engenders confidence in each marriage partner that the other is going to still be there tomorrow when you wake up in the morning he or she is still going to be there. And therefore, it's safe for him or her to open their hearts and be vulnerable, to be willing to be the sinner that I am, to let you know the worst about me. So sex becomes both a basis for that kind of intimacy and an expression of it. Protected by the marriage fence, rather than a substitute for intimacy. See, a lot of people think sex is intimacy, and it's even called being intimate. Sex is not being intimate. It's being physical. It's the basis for intimacy, and hence the expression of that intimacy as well. Now, women who agree to a sexual relationship outside the fence of marriage are looking for this intimacy, and they hope to find it through sex. However, the physical act itself 
without the commitment of marriage creates a one flesh bond, yes, but it's not the same as personal intimacy with a man she ultimately longs for in her heart. That's what she wants. She wants intimacy in her heart with a man, and she's hoping that sex will do it. She could well establish a soul tie to one with which she has no intimate relationship at all. And she will still have, if she has sex every day, she will still have the longing in her heart that sex alone cannot ever satisfy. Intimacy on the one hand and a one flesh soul tie on the other are obviously not synonymous as there is no personal intimacy with a prostitute. While Paul says there is, yes, there is a soul tie. Now becoming one flesh, now this is important to understand, and those of us who've been married know this is true. Becoming one flesh through sex in marriage is no guarantee of intimacy. You still may not have intimacy because that's worked out as you learn to open your heart up to one another. But the commitment is there to give the couple time to establish that intimacy if they're both desirous of doing so. We've got to learn to put our walls down. I've got to know that my wife is still going to be there tomorrow, next month, next year. I can learn to be vulnerable with her. I can learn to trust her. I can learn to be intimate with her, share my deepest longings with her. And sex builds that one flesh bond that, that brands us. We'll talk about this more later. Brands us for one another so that intimacy can occur. The bond established through sex, the soul tie, is the basis. Personal intimacy is a growing experience based on that basis. <clears throat> One factor which is very important to establish uh, in establishing intimacy is found in Genesis 2.25. Now get this. This is the next verse after 2.24 that I've already quoted. 2.25 says this. They were both naked the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. In the Garden of Eden, this nakedness was certainly physical. But I believe in the context of Genesis 2, there is a much, much deeper meaning. 1 John 1, 7 talks about that same idea. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have the word here is fellowship. You might also include the word intimacy. Fellowship or intimacy with one another. Walking in the light is another way of saying naked and is an irreplaceable prerequisite for intimate fellowship. It means openness, honesty, and vulnerability. For example, is a man and woman in her marriage? It's important that they're completely transparent with one another about their past, about past indiscretions, that they be naked with each other, for there is a covering and hiding, if there is a covering and hiding of previous sexual experiences because of shame, personal intimacy will be impossible. The advice given in many syndicated advice columns I, as a matter of fact, I read an Ann Landers column some 15 or 20 years ago, and a lady wrote in and said, uh, I just had an affair. My husband knows nothing about it, and I've ended the affair. Uh, what should I do? Should I tell him? And Ann Landers' brilliant advice was, don't tell him. What he doesn't know won't hurt him. Well, she doesn't have a biblical perspective, does she? She doesn't know about walking in the light. She doesn't know about naked and unashamed. That's the problem with, with going to advice columns and psychology books rather than the Bible. If followed, if the Ann Landers advice is followed, it could keep the hider and would keep the hider, the one who's hiding, from experiencing what God has for him or her in their marriage. Any pretense, any deception, 
any deceit or any lying between marriage partners will destroy the oneness God intends for his one flesh fighting unit. Now this sounds theoretical a bit. It sounds maybe a, a little bit impossible, but this is something that's the goal. Nobody experiences this perfectly. It's a matter of walking this out over a period of years after you're married. But the way you start, the basis for this, is your one flesh relationship. The goal we're after is naked and unashamed. And the only place for this to safely occur for two lovers is within the bonds of the marriage covenant. Now, how can you be unashamed if you are ashamed? Let's say you have had previous sexual experiences and you're currently involved with another person and you uh, are ashamed of what you've done. Maybe this person is a Christian or maybe you've become a Christian recently or you've begun to walk with the Lord and you look back over your past and what you see is shame. You, you feel guilt. You're un you are ashamed. How can you be unashamed if you're ashamed? You can't, can you? You can tell yourself, I'm not ashamed, I'm not ashamed, I'm not ashamed. I'm forgiven, I'm forgiven, I'm forgiven. God loves me, God loves me, God loves me. But if it ain't there, it ain't there. So how can you be unashamed of previous sexual indiscretions? Well, in Ephesians chapter 1, Paul, I think, gives us the answer here. Paul prays for the Ephesians, and here's what he says. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him having the eyes of your heart enlightened that you may know with your heart. Know what? Know how much he loves you. How much you're forgiven. No matter what you have done. Now, until God opens those eyes of your heart, you can tell yourself you're not ashamed, but you are. So that's the prayer for you if that's where you find yourself today. Now in the next session, we're going to look more closely at what it means for the two to become one flesh. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the, the majesty of your plan. And thank you for this design to make two people one flesh. The experience of which is the most fulfilling of all human relationships. And Lord, I pray you would show us the gravity of that experience, the importance of it. I pray you would open the eyes of our hearts to show us how much you love us and what you have for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, questions or comments? Yes, ma'am. Over the summer, I ran into three different relatives who are young people in their 20s who are living with a person that they plan to marry in the future and they seem to have made vows and promises to each other. They are faithful to each other. They have the idea that they're going to be together. Uh, but they're putting off a wedding. And it seems to me that, like, in their minds, they're putting off the formal event, but they already feel that they have that commitment to each other. Um, and I was thinking about in the Bible how when Rebecca was brought to Isaac, they just went into the tent and that was it. It yeah. didn't seem like there were witnesses yeah. this formal ceremony that we have come to recognize as the wedding. Today, what do you have to say about Well, there were no questions about the fact that Isaac and Rebecca were, were married. I mean, they were married because she came specifically to give herself to him. So uh, the, 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 there's, uh, I don't know if they had marriage ceremonies in those days or not. But uh, there's a reason uh, in, in our culture today why we do that. And I'm going to talk about that in great detail in a later session. But just, just to, uh, maybe just to give you a little hint... Um, there's something about ignoring the marriage fence that doesn't create confidence. Uh, in other words, uh, um, yeah, he said that, but he's not willing to make that public. Can I really trust him? Does he, has he made vows publicly that people have heard? The reason people go to weddings is to be witnesses. We're going to witness to these vows that these people are making before God himself. Have you made a vow before God? Or are you whispering sweet nothings in your girl's ears? That's what we used to call them, sweet nothings. And what does that mean? It means in the heat of the moment, I'm going to tell her whatever she wants for me to get my objective. 
So there's something about going public and proclaiming to all the world, I am committed permanently to this person that, that is, is the fence that holds people in and keeps other people out. So does she have a ring on her finger? Does she have a ring on her finger? No, she doesn't have a ring. So some guy sees she's not married. I'm going to hit on her. So she's fair game. If, if I was a humanist and I was looking for a beautiful girl and here she is, and are, are you married? No. Okay, well, you're fair game. And so if I'm good looking enough and cool enough, maybe I can convince her that I'm, you know, she needs to leave that guy. See, there's no permanent. You can talk about permanent commitment all you want. The homosexual community talks about permanent commitment all the time. And occasionally there'll be, there'll be a, a homosexual couple that'll, that'll stay together, but it's rare. And it's rare for that kind of a person to stay together for life as well. That's a good comment. Any other questions? Okay, the purpose of that seminar was to obviously see the importance of marriage. Marriage is the ground, the place for sex to occur. And, and there are some strong reasons, obviously, why that's the case. And we went over those. Protection, a place to be naked and unashamed with confidence that that person is going to... See, the question I would have, Kathy, is this. If you, if you have this kind of commitment to me, why don't you want to marry me? I, I mean, a, a girl is looking for security. There's something about you, if you're not willing to make a public statement, uh, there, there's, there's something about you that is, is not going to give me the confidence I'm going to need. I think in our culture, too, that the wedding itself has become this expensive event. If you watch, the girls watch a TV show about, say, yes, she has these $10,000 wedding dresses. Who knows how much the wedding itself costs. And so these couples are, they have this idea that they're putting off the actual ceremony while they save up toward this goal. And it seems like our culture has just put the cart in the horse and made it almost impossible for people to do things in the right order. Well, that's really true. And I'm, when Jill and I got married, we didn't have a dinner. We had, we had a wedding cake. And, and I think our pictures cost $80. And uh, the, the whole wedding probably didn't cost any more than... Uh, uh, Jill, I, 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 how much did we spend on the wedding? How much did you spend? She, she got a wedding dress. It, it's probably less than 500 bucks, I'm sure. Well, yeah, but okay, multiply it by 10 times and, and you might have $4,000. But, but you don't have to We're spend. This. <laughs> well, you don't, you don't, it, it, I, I think uh, the whole thing is the vows. And, and it, it's, it's you're, you're making vows before God and these witnesses. So that's the point of a marriage. It's not, if you have the money and you want to have a big party, that's good. But that's not, that's not everything. 